Frank Herbert's sci-fi all-timer Dune has historically proven to be a tough movie to make. After a few early attempts failed, including one that made for an incredible documentary, <laughs> Dune first hit the big screen in 1984. Written and directed by David Lynch, the adaptation is... It is what it is. You know what, that's fair. Initially a box office and critical flop, 1984's Dune has since gained something of a cult following. But how did an avant-garde indie darling taking his first crack at big budget Hollywood adapt a wildly popular fantasy epic with world building so thorough it needs its own dictionary? Let the spice flow and get all eyes on Arrakis because it's time to ask, what's the difference? A beginning is a very delicate time. To start with, we'll be using the theatrical release of Dune, the one that still has David Lynch's name on it. There were other longer edits of the movie credited to Alan Smithy, the pseudonym used by directors who want to disown the version of the film you're about to watch, but we don't want to mess with those. Well, sure, who does? But even with his theatrical version, he'll tell you it's not really his. Now, I thought he said June instead of Dune. The point here is, this adaptation was as difficult to manage as a spice mining operation. Oh, the spice melange. Good for everything, from turning your eyes blue to folding the fabric of space. It's like cinnamon, only when you huff it, you see your own future. Or like psychedelic orgy paprika that's also making wormholes. And everything about the spice is at the dead center of Dune. The worm is the spice. The spice is the worm. By the 80s, not even 20 years after first hitting the shelves, Dune already had a reputation for being unfilmable. The book checks in north of 600 pages and also includes four appendices detailing the religion and ecology of Arrakis, a report on the Bene Gesserit, the religious group of women pulling the strings behind the scenes, an almanac of the great houses of the galaxy, plus maps and encyclopedias just in case anything is still unclear. Weather. Sea storms. So as it turns out, there are so many things different between Frank Herbert's book and David Lynch's movie. Too many things, in fact. If you're expecting an exhaustive description of every little thing that's different, this is not it. That's just simply not how David Lynch and the film's producers went about it. Imagine Herbert's book as a jigsaw puzzle, and David Lynch's movie as a table that's just not big enough to put the whole puzzle together on. But it's the only table he had in 1984, so adapting the film was about how to at least distill what you can't directly adapt. Some things could fall away, and I still feel felt that it was still saying Dune. In spite of all the puzzle pieces that wound up on the floor, all the major characters and the broad strokes of the plot make it into the film. The House Atreides is asked to take over as ruling house on Arrakis, the only planet in the galaxy that produces the all-important spice melange. That dusty little love child of LSD and mental time travel. But meanwhile, their mortal enemies, the Harkonnens, plot to destroy the Atreides family and wipe them from existence while the politics of the Emperor, the Spacing Guild, and religious Bene Gesserit priestesses hang in the balance, which makes it a proper sci-fi fantasy epic that actually is kinda impossible to squeeze into a feature film runtime. And of all the many differences, the biggest one, the one that really changes the shape of the film, actually the only one we're going to talk about, begins with the very first scene of the movie. From the start of the film, Lynch uses pretty standard tactics in paring down an adaptation, but in the process, reframed the focus of the entire story. So the big difference we want to focus on, he rearranged the sh** out of that first act. The movie opens with a monologue from Princess Irulan, daughter of the Padishah Emperor, which provides a heavy dose of exposition and a dramatic reveal of the film's title. In the novel, similar bits of exposition are given at the beginning of each chapter, as written by Princess Irulan in historical accounts of the events at Arrakis. So that was easy enough to repurpose for Lynch. The planet is Arrakis, also known as June. After the title sequence, though, we get another exposition dump in the form of a secret Spacing Guild report. Here we get the basic galactic lay of the land between Arrakis, the Atreides, the Harkonnens, and the Emperor. Information we get in the book bit by bit, as we meet characters who would, you know, make sense to have that information. A third stage guild navigator will be here within minutes. The first proper scene in the film comes after four and a half straight minutes of exposition. It's a meeting between the Padishah Emperor and representatives of the Spacing Guild. It's here that the Emperor outlines the plan to send the Atreides into a trap on Arrakis to this high-ranking Spacing Guild slug-looking navigator who is concerned about the plan's disruption to mining Dune Spice, aka if shrooms could also fly to another star. We have just folded space from Ix. 
Firstly, this scene makes a fairly major choice to deviate from the book. The Emperor lays out his concerns that Duke Leto is doing some under-the-table army building. Using a technique unknown to us, a technique involving sound. The Emperor is referencing the weirding modules that turn vocal commands into fun 80s laser blasts, which seemed a more cinematic way to portray the Bene Gesserit's reality-bending fighting style that Herbert called the weirding way in the book. Oh? On top of that, this scene introduces us to the Spacing Guild and the Emperor much earlier than the book does. In fact, the Space Guild Navigator isn't seen at all in the novel. It isn't until the sequel, Dune Messiah, that Herbert describes the dude-meets-ugly-fish physical appearance of the spice-mutated navigator. Navigators. But the order of events already becomes significant. This meeting, the very first scene of the film, portrays them as the story's primary antagonists, worried about being overthrown by a house with weirding modules. They represent the main force opposing Paul and his family, which frames the entire movie differently. And with a load of exposition and a scene describing the events as they're about to unfold, Movie Dune becomes a story about political machinations. Yes. In the book, however, from the very first chapter, we're with Paul, the protagonist of the story. We're literally inside his head in the first chapter, eavesdropping on a dream about the mysterious desert planet he's about to move to, and the Fremen woman, Chani, whom he hasn't met yet. He's immediately put to the test by the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother with her Gom Jabbar, and a box full of real bad pain. So by meeting Paul first and seeing him tested, the story is one of a young man with worlds of pressure and expectation being brutally tested and succeeding. But the movie, by presenting the deck that's stacked against the characters before we meet the characters, doesn't just change how we see the protagonists, but the antagonists as well. By giving the scheme to the Emperor and the Spacing Guild Cuttlefish or whatever, the movie takes the dastardly plot away from Baron. Harkonnen. My plan! The plan. The book Baron arrives in the story immediately after Paul's Gom Jabbar test and unveils the plan to destroy House Atreides. His plan. By giving the plan over to other villains in the story, it reduces Baron Harkonnen to a gross boil covered player in somebody else's scheme. He's still plenty evil, offensively so, but he's a less formidable presence than he is in the book. More formidable, however, is Baron Harkonnen's nephew, Fade Rautha. Played in the film by Sting, who is having just the best time, Fade is bloodthirsty and violent from the jump. He even appears in Paul's dream alongside Arrakis and Chani to threaten him. This is also before we, the viewer, have met Sting, er, Fade. Or, more significantly, Baron Harkonnen himself. This presents Fade, at least to start with, as a bigger threat to Paul. Meanwhile, we first meet Movie Paul as he's studying Arrakis on prescient sort of touchscreen encyclopedias. This way, Lynch is able to give us more exposition in an organic, not straight-to-camera monologue kind of way. And because the difficulty of explaining the intricate world of Dune organically was Frank Herbert's problem before it was David Lynch's, these scenes are more or less adapted straight from their book counterparts. In these scenes, we meet Atreides stalwarts Gurney Halleck, Thufir Hawat, Dr. Wellington Yue, and Duncan Idaho. They're all in some way Paul's teachers, and the scenes play out more or less the same way they do in the book. But it's in this sequence that we are told Paul is a talented and adept steward. Duke Leto himself tells Paul slash us as much. And remember, this is all happening before the Gom Jabbar. And here, finally, 22 minutes in, the film circles back to the opening pages of the book. The arrival of the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohayim to administer the Gom Jabbar. <laughs> By moving this test so far back after we know the plot against his family and after we know that he's capable and strong, the movie lowers the stakes of the scene because we know these things about him already. While opening the book with the Gom Jabbar immediately introduces him to a world that is deadly and devious, and everybody he meets after is viewed through a more dubious lens. While meeting all his family and friends prior to the test, the Gom Jabbar scene in the movie serves to shatter the innocence of his life more than anything else. However, the Gom Jabbar test and the introduction to Baron Harkonnen happen back to back in both the book and movie. Paul is tested in earnest for the first time by the Reverend Mother immediately before the introduction of the character that will be his family's ultimate test. And from there, like we said, the movie proceeds along the same general trajectory of the book, with a thousand little differences, cuts, and compressions along the way. So much so that entire side plots vanish. Like the group of spice workers threatening to leave, or the garden room that Lady Jessica discovers in their Air King castle, or staff meetings with the Duke's council where they discuss strategy and meet with the Fremen leader Stilgar. David Lynch and the movie version frankly don't do a whole lot to smooth out the missing scenes, however, because the movie also loses a great deal of the Fremen legend that is to 
to be Paul's destiny, which is hinted at several times through gauzy voiceover, thoughts recorded in whispers by the actors that are more or less a direct translation of italicized quotes in the book. And Lady Jessica getting a Chris knife Casey? from her Fremen household staff. Casey, are a you... dinner party with smugglers. Did Duncan you, uh... Idaho gets ripped and makes a scene one night. Did you start doing your own thing? Hmm? Oh, I was just thinking about more stuff that got cut wholesale from the book. Ah, right. Yeah, no, it, it is a lot. But as I was saying, even without a clear Fremen legend backstory, Paul still becomes the Muad'Dib and leads the Fremen in a revolt against the Harkonnens and the Emperor, still falls in love with Chani, and fulfills his destiny to become the Kwisatz Haderach. It just happens a lot quicker in the movie, doesn't make complete sense unless you've read the book, and Paul ends up conjuring rain at the end, instead of bringing peace to the galaxy the old-fashioned way. Arranged marriage. That's it for this episode. Sorry we didn't make it an hour and a half long. I'm not. Yeah, me neither. Let us know what you think of Dune in the comments. Still unfilmable? And be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more What's the Difference.